For a brief moment, it was all the world could talk about. On April the 15th, 2023, clashes erupted between Sudan's army and the paramilitary rapid support forces in the capital of Khartoum. As the fighting spread, the death toll mounted, countries raced to evacuate their citizens, embassies were shuttered, escapes facilitated, all broadcast in round-the-clock coverage. But then, a funny thing happens. With evacuations over, the story faded, dropping off the headlines as quickly as it had blown up in the first place. Today, encountering coverage of Sudan's conflict in the regular media is a rare event. On the day this introduction was written, that's November the 6th, the BBC Africa front page covered floods in Somalia, Chad recalling its envoys from Israel, and YouTuber Mr. Beast building wells in Africa. Only those who scrolled far down would have noticed a single short headline about shelling hitting a Sudanese market. So how did this happen? How did a conflict that briefly dominated our news feeds become a mere media footnote? Well, today we're taking a look at both Sudan's ongoing war and investigating the weird lack of wider interest. State Collapse now, the first odd thing about the relative silence on Sudan is that it's hardly a small or obscure country. At 1.89 million square kilometers, Sudan is the third largest nation in Africa, a country home to over 45 million people. Nor is it particularly unimportant in the global scheme of things. With a long Red Sea coastline, the country is situated on a vital trade route, one that will only increase in importance as Saudi Arabia sinks money into developing its own adjacent coastline across the waters. The second odd thing about the lack of coverage is that this isn't some low-intensity war that's only impacting a few unfortunate villages. By most reckonings, it now ranks among our planet's most devastating crises. Here's UN Undersecretary General Martin Griffith speaking in October, six months after the conflict erupted, quote, Half a year of war has plunged Sudan into one of the worst humanitarian nightmares in recent history. Now, that's a pretty unambiguous statement, nor is it hyperbole. With over 5.6 million people displaced by the fighting, Sudan ranks alongside Ukraine and Syria in terms of refugees. Within the nation's borders, more people are thought to be in desperate need of aid than in Ukraine. Admittedly, the official death toll of Sudan's conflict is far lower, far lower than either Ukraine or Syria, lower too than that produced so far by the war in Gaza. Yet while Sudan's official death toll might only stand at 9,000, there are very good reasons to believe that that is an undercount. Reuters recently did an in-depth report into a springtime attack by the Rapid Support Forces and their allies on the city of El Janina in Darfur, a region in the west of Sudan that's home to both nomadic Arab tribes and black African ethnic groups like the Masalit. Over two months, the RSF slaughtered people in the city, conducting house-to-house -house executions, attacking convoys of refugees trying to flee. Overall, a local surgeon quoted in the Reuters piece estimates 4,000 people were killed in El Janina alone. And the city is far from the only ones who have been sacked amidst the fighting. In July, the UN estimated at least 13 mass graves were now dotted across the Darfur region, the result of a genocidal campaign carried out by the RSF and Janjaweed militias against the Masalit. Survivors have reported snipers picking off people in the streets, aid camps being sacked and burned, mosques blown up even as civilians cower inside them. Just a week before we began work on this piece, South Darfur's capital, Niala, fell to the RSF. Going by the violence unleashed on El Janina, it seems likely that more atrocities have been carried out there as well. Darfur, of course, has been the site of mass killings before. In the 2000s, the region's name became byword for genocide. Unlike 15 years ago, though, the violence in this war is not contained in Sudan's west. For all cities like El Janina have suffered, the capital of Khartoum has arguably suffered more. The location of the initial clashes between the RSF and Sudanese armed forces, usually referred to as the SAF, Khartoum has spent the majority of 2023 as a war zone. Hospitals have been flattened in airstrikes, the presidential palace attacked, iconic buildings like the Greater Nile Petroleum Operating Company Tower destroyed in fires. From a pre-war metro population of 6.34 million, perhaps half have fled. Those that remain have endured food shortages, blackouts, lootings, and pitched gun battles. As The Economist noted of the extensive damage, Sudan's capital has become Africa's Aleppo. And tragically, it could soon get much, much worse. The war has closed most of the nation's transport routes, making shipping supplies around the country next to impossible. Combined with a bad harvest this year, it's estimated that by December, up to 6 million people will be on the cusp of famine. We mentioned all this horror 
not just to depress you, but to emphasize just how big of a calamity this really is. How wild it is, though only a few media outlets are covering it in any depth at all. We'll be examining why this is in coming chapters. For now, though, we need to take a few minutes to quickly sketch out the background of this war, to try and understand exactly how things got so bad in the first place. Children of the Revolution so when the first bombs fell on April the 15th, their detonations acted not just as the opening salvos of a new war, but as a coda to a brief period of hope, a requiem for Sudan's revolution. Prior to 2019, Sudan had spent three full decades under the thumb of Amar al-Bashir, a tyrant who ruled not so much with an iron fist as a wrist-mounted machine gun. Al-Bashir, who came to power in a coup, was the guy who oversaw the genocide in Darfur, the guy who encouraged the Arab Janjaweed militias in their atrocities to such an extent that he's to this day wanted by the ICC for crimes against humanity. Like most dictators, he was also a paranoid guy, so much so that in 2013 he invited the Janjaweed to form an official paramilitary force, the Rapid Support Forces. The idea was that the RSF would act as a counterweight to the Sudanese army, lest al-Bashir's generals start imagining that they might look good on the throne. But the dictator should have paid attention to the Janjaweed's name, which can be translated as devils on horseback. And like all devils, the RSF wouldn't be even remotely troubled by feelings of loyalty. Things came to a head in the spring of 2019, following months of protests. On April the 11th, the military joined the public, removing al-Bashir from power. What followed was a quick transition to a so-called Sovereignty Council, one comprising both military men and civilians, and intended to chart the leaking ship Sudan on a course toward democracy. Not that it was just the regular army who held seats on the council. If al-Bashir had expected the RSF to protect him from such coups, he'd badly misjudged the devil's loyalty. Deputy Chair of the Council was Mohammed Hamdan Degalo, universally known as Hamedi. A former Janjaweed commander from the Arab Rizigat tribe, Hamedi was responsible for the Darfur War's worst atrocities. But rather than being rewarded with a long stay in the Ninth Circle of Hell, he had instead been placed at the head of the RSF. By the eve of the revolution, he had 100,000 men under his command. But Hameti wasn't the only powerful player on the new council. There was also General Abdel Fattah al burhan A former army commander in Darfur, al burhan rose to power in the chaos of the revolution, eventually becoming chairman of the Sovereignty Council. Initially, the general insisted he was merely playing a transitional role, that he would be Sudan's de facto leader only up to the moment that civilian government could take the reins. But in a nation with a history of military coups and army rule, could such a man really be believed? And the answer came in October of 2021. On the 25th of that month, al Buran and Hameti teamed up to remove the civilian members from the council and cancelled the transition to democracy. Although there were protests, the cynical power play worked. General al Buran became the effective leader of Sudan, with Hameti at his side. Not that the younger man had any intention of staying in the general's shadow. The Sudan War Monitor has noted the kind of man Hameti is. A guy who lets his loyal followers refer to him as president, emir, and commander-in-chief. A guy who, as leader of the RSF, stands at the head of a vast militia drawn from Sudan's poor, downtrodden, and ignored. A conduit for decades of resentment felt against the military elites in Khartoum. With a combustible mix like that leading it, it was probably only a matter of time before Sudan ignited. The spark uh, was a plan to integrate the RSF into Sudan's regular military structure, an eerily similar trigger to the Russian army's plan to take over Wagner, which led to Prigozhin's aborted mutiny. But while the Wagner uprising fizzles out in hours, the RSF's violent backlash remains ongoing to this very day. State of play. Now at this point, we probably need to be clear that there's more to the conflict between RSF and SAF than mere personality clashes between their two leaders. Now, that is still a major part of it. Hameti is a ruthless guy from a humble background who, under the guise of restoring democracy, seems determined to actually make himself the king. But we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we didn't at least touch upon the outside actors who helped push the RSF and the SAF towards the extreme actions that they're now taking. Writing in The Guardian, Sudanese journalist Nasreen Malik pointed to despotic governments in North Africa, such as Egypt, the back the SAF after the revolution to quote, in order to extinguish the prospect of a democracy flourishing in their backyard. 
While that backing resulted in the 2021 coup that removed the civilian element from the government, it also helped destabilize a nation already suffering a power vacuum. Meanwhile, the RSF seems to have forged an alliance with Russia and the Wagner Group in exchange for control of lucrative gold mines. Since the war broke out, the United Arab Emirates has also emerged as a major RSF backer. Still, our intention today is not to present you with a comprehensive history of Sudan's conflict. That would require weeks more research and a video runtime in the region of about four hours. What we want to do instead is sketch out events just enough that we can go into our chapters on the conflict's media coverage feeling at least somewhat informed. Not just about the backgrounds of the major players, but also regarding where things stand. Because in the seven months since this war erupted, Sudan has gone from being an at least theoretically united country to one that seems to be cracking apart. And nowhere is this more evidence than in Khartoum. When the fighting began, it was assumed that the SAF's technological superiority would net it a quick, bloody victory. But that's not what happened in the capital. Instead, Sudan's main city has fractured into two parts, controlled by rival factions. In the downtown area, the RSF seized not only the presidential palace, but also most former government ministries. Further out, residential areas and warehouses are likewise under the militia's control. In fact, RSF power is so widespread in the capital that General Al Buran fled the city over the summer, setting up an alternative capital in Port Sudan on the Red Sea coast. Yet for all their advances, the RSF has failed to completely take Khartoum. The SAF still holds multiple army bases, including the vital Wadi Saidna Air Base. It's a situation that's playing out in other parts of the country in similar ways. In the Khartoum-adjacent city of Omdurman, for example, RSF gains are still offset by the SAF stubbornly clinging on. But there's one region where the RSF are in all but total control. Darfur. On October the 31st, Sudan War Monitor reported the fall of the region's second city, Nyala, as well as the loss of the army's 21st Infantry Division headquartered in Zalingi. According to the publication, to quote, this would leave only the SAF garrison in the Darfur region in Al Fashir, where intermittent clashes and RSF drone attacks took place late Tuesday. Nominally, SAF still have forces in Al Dain and Buram, but these forces seem to be on good terms with the RSF and unwilling to fight. End quote. Now, this is in sharp contrast to the east of the country, where the SAF seems to be largely in control. As such, many are fearing a potential Libya or Yemen scenario where the nation essentially splits in two. Worryingly, this might be an optimistic outcome. A pessimistic one might be a far broader shattering, akin to the breakup of Yugoslavia. The US Institute of Peace reports that violence has dispersed beyond the SAF and RSF commands. This is troubling, as Sudan has traditionally been home to multiple separatist armed groups. While five of the major ones agreed to lay down their arms following the 2020 Juba Peace Agreement, some are now threatening to take advantage of the chaos and return to fighting. With most of Sudan's tribes additionally in possession of weapons and divided along ethnic lines, it's all too easy to see how things could spin out of control. At the end of all that, then, We've hopefully convinced you that this is a major deal, a conflict that is already horrific, but has the potential to turn far, far worse. And while this all brings us back to our original question, why isn't this getting more airtime? Why isn't the world as attentive to Sudan's collapse as it is to the conflicts in Gaza and in Ukraine? It's a question that we're going to try our best to answer in the coming parts of the video. The Invisible War. When we bemoan Sudan's lack of media coverage, we need to be clear that we're not claiming no one is covering this war. Right now, there are dozens of passionate, knowledgeable reporters on the ground in Sudan working in unbelievably difficult conditions to try and get word out about the conflict. Some are independent journalists contributing to outlets like Sudan War Monitor. Others are employees of traditional media organizations like Reuters. What they have in common is that they're all doing excellent work that we neither have the budget nor expertise nor, frankly, the balls to do ourselves. Seriously, the absolute last thing that we want you to take from this video is that literally nobody is covering the crisis. No, when we ask why is the world ignoring Sudan's civil war, we mean it more broadly. Why isn't the work of those reporters trending on social media or leading the headlines? Why is it that you can walk into a random bar and find people with strong opinions on the wars in Ukraine and Gaza, but you're unlikely to find anyone following the events in Sudan? And this is important, because what the public cares about can drive how governments react, and it can also drive where donor dollars flow. Context News has noted how aid donations are barely half of what the UN estimates is needed to avert catastrophe for Sudan civilians. Charities and non-governmental organizations report insufficient funding to operate hospitals. So, now seems like a vital time to ask what is driving this lack of attention. 
One theory we came across multiple times while researching this video is that racism is playing a role. Progressive magazine The Nation recently published a savage attack on the American media by two Sudanese activists who compared the coverage to that of the Ukraine war and declared, white Europeans now being killed, wounded, or rendered homeless by Russian troops are victims worthy of media attention, while Sudanese facing similar fates aren't. The quote ends. And look, obviously, as a non-American white dude reading a script written by another non-American white dude, it's kind of awkward for me to judge the racism or otherwise of the American media. Nonetheless, there are some signs that something deeper is at play than mere prejudice. It's worth remembering that the Darfur War in the 2000s received overwhelming coverage in the US and the wider West, as did the 2011 secession of South Sudan. And while it's possible the media of 2023 is more racist than the media of 2011, other stories taking place in Africa this year generated endless headlines. Just think back to the Niger coup, for example. No. If we really want to understand what's going on, we need to consider other factors. One of which may include how past coverage of Sudan affected people's perceptions. If you're among the younger viewers today, you may not be aware just how much attention was lavished on Sudan in the 2000s. The Darfur genocide was a key concern of global leaders, while the South Sudanese fight for independence was a cause celeb among politicians and celebrity activists. As vitally important as that work was, it resulted in Sudan becoming linked in people's minds with war and atrocity. So when the 2023 conflict broke out, a lot of people in the West may have basically been like, oh, another one? Writing in State Press, Sudanese-American journalist Fatima Gabir describes how, quote, the sudden shock value of the war didn't affect non-Sudanese people because they had a preconceived notion that the country's citizens always lived in conflict. Later on in that same piece, she quotes a Sudanese-American student who comes to similar conclusions about the media coverage, saying, there's not a lot of humanization around Sudanese people's culture, history, struggles, or anything. It's just, oh, more Africans or Middle Easterners killing themselves. Now, to be fair, Sudan really has suffered more than its fair share of wars. Since independence in 1956, there have been two full civil wars, not including this one, the Darfur Genocide, a conflict in the states of South Kordofan and Blue Nile, plus all the violence that surrounded South Sudan's transition to independence. That doesn't mean there was anything inevitable about the current fight between the RSF and the SAF, but perhaps it does partly explain the broader lack of interest. Unfortunately, war fatigue is a real thing among the media, and the new and shocking always takes precedence over what's perceived as business as usual. Awful as it is to say out loud, many creators and consumers may have simply felt the current conflict in Sudan was just par for the course. Especially when combined with other political trends that were quietly reshaping the world. Divided, distracted. Back in September, the UN's World Food Programme director, Cindy McCain, described on ABC how the WFP was suffering its worst funding shortage in 60 years. In trying to explain why there was so little money to support starving people, McCain suggested that too much donor attention was focused on Ukraine. Quote, Ukraine, for better or worse, has sucked the oxygen out of the room. And I, we, certainly understand the need to support Ukraine. But there's other hotspots in the world that are deeply and as much desperate as Ukraine is. It was a quote that got picked up by many of those arguing that Western donors are more focused on the suffering of Europeans than non-white people. That nation piece that we just mentioned, for example, used McCain's words to justify their central thesis. But blaming Ukraine hides a far more ominous truth. Where Africa is concerned, donor interest has been fading now for several years. Back in the 2000s, foreign aid to sub-Saharan Africa, of which Sudan is geographically, if not politically, a part, accounted for 4% of the region's GDP. Today, the IMF puts the figure at 2.5%. This decade alone, Context News reports that major donors like Canada, Japan, and Norway have all reduced aid to Africa, even as humanitarian needs have grown. Obviously, this isn't a video on aid donations, but given voter concerns often help drive policy in democracies, that reduction in spending could indicate a longer-term apathy among the public towards crises in Africa, an apathy that doubtless helps shape national media coverage. This may be especially true of Sudan, where the regime of al-Bashir cloaked itself in secrecy for the best part of 30 years. Speaking to state press, Sudanese-American political writer Sarah El Hassan noted of the regime's isolationism, some people didn't know where Sudan was until Rihanna posted about it in 2019. I think it's difficult for the world to care when they have no frame of reference for people they don't know. End quote. 
That's not to say that the Ukraine war and the war in Gaza aren't crowding out other conflicts. Arab News recently bemoaned how the war in Ukraine and the escalating crisis in the Middle East have diverted the focus of the international community, leaving Sudan's conflagrations suffering an inadvertent visibility crisis. That a sense of apathy and confusion combined with an image of Sudan as a place always racked by conflict may have meant this war has less chance of breaking through. After all, Israel is deeply familiar to Americans and Europeans. Sudan is seen as something distant. Interesting as all this analysis is, though, we've so far left out what may be a key part, the part that doesn't involve the media consumption habits of Westerners, but the warring parties themselves. Specifically, the way a lack of coverage may be exactly what the RSF wants. Earlier this year, we did an in-depth video asking why Ethiopia's blood-soaked Tigray war went almost unnoticed by the wider world. A major component turned out to be the Ethiopian government implementing an information blackout across the war zone. Telecommunications were cut off. Anyone entering or leaving Tigray was searched for anything that might carry images of the conflict to the outside world. In this way, Addis Ababa managed to stop the war from gaining traction on social media, depriving an image-focused culture of the means for grabbing people's attention. Well, it looks like some in Sudan may have learned from that conflict. The recent RSF atrocities in Darfur have been accompanied by similar blackouts, attempts to cut those suffering off from the outside world. According to Reuters, telecommunication networks have been taken down during periods of violence. Civilians fleeing the fighting have had their phones confiscated at militia checkpoints. This is completely different to Ukraine, where both Kiev and Moscow regularly publish videos of their successes to keep morale up. Different, too, to the Gaza war, where both sides wage a propaganda battle through images. Maybe in our hypervisual culture, bad actors like the RSF have figured out that public interest wanes with no new content to consume, that internationally hiding a conflict today is as easy as cutting off a telecoms network. But whatever the real cause, one thing's certain, we should all be paying more attention to what's happening in Sudan, not just because it's a humanitarian disaster zone, but because of where the conflict might lead. If Sudan collapses into a Libya or Yemen-style failed state, then the consequences for the entire world are going to be both profound and profoundly terrifying. As World Politics Review wrote, a power vacuum in Sudan would attract jihadists and mercenaries alike. A country that spent nearly 30 years on the US terrorism list could once again play host to groups of unchecked jihadists from across the region, creating a security nightmare that Washington and its allies would struggle to contain. Think of the way Libya's crisis has repeatedly threatened to spill over. Think how state collapse in Somalia created all sorts of new dangers. Well, Sudan is far, far bigger than either of those and far more important for the region. If it fractures, we're all going to feel the impact. The sooner more of us in the media, even those just running smallish YouTube channels, start talking seriously about this possibility, the better all our chances of averting a catastrophe.